Hi, welcome to everybody who's joined us for our latest session in our what we're calling now our Convergent Hybrid Conference. It'll be a series of online and in-person events held throughout the year. The first one this week, this month we've got is uh, on malicious domains, where they are and what we can do about them. So a big welcome to everybody who's uh, joined us for this session today. Um, my name's Narelle Clark. I'm the CEO of the Internet Association of Australia. And we're really looking forward to having a few great sessions throughout the year in this new format, the hybrid conference. We'll get a few, we'll try and make some in-person events throughout the, the country uh, and we'll have them in different, different places. At least we've got some scheduled already for Melbourne and some more info about that soon. So a couple of housekeeping notes. This event is being recorded and we will be put, putting that up on our website after afterwards. We'll be sending out a feedback survey not long after the event closes and anybody who actually responds to the survey will be entered into a prize draw. And our people have liked our prizes in the past. We've, we've uh, handed out some cute little access points and other you know, micro ticks and such like. So please get into the draw. The thing about the survey, it does tell us what we're doing wrong, right and otherwise. Gives us some ideas for improvements, future topics, and even you can put yourselves forward for um, so uh, to tell us about projects that you've been doing or demos of fun stuff you've been up to. You could even do some peering socials. Hey, who doesn't mind a peering social? So throughout this session today, can you please post your questions to the Q&A or in the chat window? I've got my team in the background there, Sabrina and Kitty, who will be monitoring it and we'll make sure that we, we get those questions pushed through. Okay. Please, yeah, let us know what you think about the session after it happens. Um, a couple of, one, one item of fine print we do need to mention, and that is that the board adopted a code of conduct for our events. And basically that means just be respectful in your, your uh, comments and questions, folks. You'd be accepting and support others to participate. If you do border on behaviour that we might think is uh, non-compliant or potentially offensive, we will kick you off. Um, you can appeal on this, but uh, we're not going to readmit you today if you if you do muck that up. We haven't had this problem in the past and we hope we'll never have it in, have it in the future, but be aware that that does exist. Okay, upcoming events. I did mention them earlier. We've got our next conversion event will be in Melbourne. We're going to be doing it on the Network Time Protocol with Dr. Daryl Veach from, uh, he's actually with UTS, but he's based in Melbourne, so the University of Technology of Sydney. That'll be on May the 9th at the Garden State Hotel, and we'll kick off registrations for that soon. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, he's been doing some measurements of the Network Time Protocol for quite some time, and he knows exactly what's wrong and right with it. So that'll be a really fun presentation. I've seen some of his data already, and I tell you, it's fascinating. Okay, I need to introduce Graham Bunton, the Executive Director of the DNS Abuse Institute, and Rowena Shu, who's their Director of Programs and Policy from the DNS Abuse Institute. So Graham Bunton is the Executive Director of the DNS Abuse Institute, which is an initiative dedicated to developing collaborative and innovative methods of reducing DNS abuse. Now, we all abuse DNS, but sometimes it gets abused <laughs> more directly. So Graham's got over 11 years of DNS policy experience, and prior to heading <clears throat> the Institute, he was head of policy for Two Cows and served as chair of the Registrar Stakeholder Group at ICANN, you know, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, for four years. Graham is one of the driving forces behind the framework to address uh, abuse, which is a new set of guidelines and principles for addressing online harms. And that's been adopted by more than 50 DNS registries and registrars. He helped found the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto and served on the board of the Internet Infrastructure Coalition for six years. So it's great to have his input here. And he's a, a great asset, I think, to the DNS Abuse Institute. Rowena, an Australian, but not located in Australia at the moment. <laughs> and thank you, Rowena, for staying up till this ungodly hour of the, of, of the uh, night for you. Rowena is the Director of Programs and Policy at the DNS in Abuse Institute. And prior to joining the Institute, she worked for Ofcom, the UK's communications regulator. She's worked for Nominet in the UK, which runs .uk, if I remember correctly, and the UK government at the Department of Digital, Culture, Media and Sport. Rowena's got over a decade of experience in and around policy and has two degrees, one in law and one in arts in, in international relations and political science from ANU. So she's certainly one of us. OK, that's enough from me in the way of intro. I'm going to hand over now to, to Graham. Now, Graham, if you could start sharing your screen, I will kill mine. I will. But first, um, thank you very much 
uh, much for the kind introduction, Narelle. I really appreciate that. And to the uh, IAA for uh, having us this evening, this morning, whatever the time might be for you. Um, it's not so late here, but I'm dialing in from uh, Toronto, Canada. But let me just share my screen and uh, we'll get right into it. Um, I should say, uh, while a Canadian, I do feel a strong affinity to Australia. I lived there for a year and I'm married to an Australian. And so it's a frequent place I visit. Um, right, malicious domains, where they are and what we can do about them. So this is sort of a presentation is a culmination of a bunch of work from Rowena and I, um, where we're going to give you some context about DNS abuse, what it is, uh, how it's defined, how the economic context it sits in. And then we're going to show some of our sort of fresh research on the issue. And from there, go into a little bit of a discussion about what we think can be done about DNS abuse. Um, and then talk a little bit about what we're currently doing. Um, so uh, feel free to ask questions. Um, I, uh, we'll try and leave some time at the end for some interaction if, if people have things they want to raise. Um, but don't be shy. You know, we're here trying to make the world a better place and always happy for more input to do that. Um, right. I think that's all I really wanted to say to get off the uh, get us started. Um, what we want to leave you with coming out of this presentation. Um, you know, I'll, I'll obviously a, a lot of the attendees today are Internet professionals, but um, in my experience, there's um, not a lot of understanding or, or room for more understanding about how the DNS industry works. Um, and by DNS, I really mean domain name registration, not necessarily like resolvers and things like that. Um, we're going to talk about the difference between malicious domain names and compromised domain names and why that's important. Then we're going to go into um, a pretty deep dive of our understanding of the distribution of DNS abuse across the ecosystem. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what can be done about these things. How do we move forward? Um, the overview of how that's going to look like is we'll talk about the DNS AI itself, go into that definition, mal versus comp, domain industry. I, slides are slightly repetitive, I realize now. Um, so a bit of context about the DNS Abuse Institute. Listening to Norell in that introduction reminded me uh, of just how long a name that is and how awkward it can be to say. Uh, I will bring that back to our marketing people. Uh, and as a pro tip for anybody considering such an endeavor, Institute is really hard to type and you're gonna get it wrong every time. Um, uh, but the DNS Abuse Institute is a project of public interest registry, uh, PIR. PIR is an American-based not-for-profit that operates the .org TLD, uh, as well as a couple others. Sorry, TLD is top-level domain, for those of you who are not deep in the industry. Um, they also run NGO, ONG, Giving Gives, I think, Foundation. Well, I don't want to get those wrong, but um, we don't spend a lot of time, <laughs> thank you, Rowena, uh, uh, looking at what's happening inside of PIR. We're very externally focused, and actually, it's worth mentioning that uh, while we certainly are a part of PIR, we don't look at any internal public interest registry policies or, or processes. We're really focused on um, working with the rest of the industry. So PIR, as I said, is a not-for-profit. Um, they have this mission to essentially make the internet better. Um, and they were looking at the prevalence of uh, malicious domain names, abusive domain names, um, and really felt that there was a gap uh, within the industry on doing something about them. There was no one sort of centrally located uh, that deals with registries and registrars that can help make a difference on this problem. Um, and similarly, in my old job, I was trying to lead some anti-abuse efforts um, when I was chair of the registrar stakeholder group in ICANN. And it was very clear to me at that time, too, that we really needed someone to sit in the middle of that. Um, and this is slightly in the weeds, but um, you would think ICANN has a natural role to play, and they do, and they do some good work in the space as well, but there's a lot of issues around abuse that are um, sort of commercially relevant or complicated, uh, and trying to solve that within the regulatory space that is ICANN didn't make a lot of sense. So here we are, we stand up the Institute in 2021 uh, with three pillars, education, collaboration, and innovation. Um, and so we spend our time developing educational resources. 
um, getting registries, registrars, internet security to talk to each other, share information. Um, and then we build uh, tools and services. So actually develop technology to help um, support the industry in its mission to reduce DNS abuse. And so that's that innovation component, which is really the fun stuff. And we'll get to that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, I describe, before I define it, DNS abuse as a collective action problem. And we'll go uh, a little bit more into this in a sec, but it, it's really, there are some structural impediments into the way, in the way that the domain registration industry works that get in the way of everybody collaborating on DNS abuse. And so that's why we created this institute, to sit in the middle of everybody, to be a neutral player in the space, to try and make a difference on these online harms. All right, what are we actually talking about when I say DNS abuse? Uh, definitions for this problem range from very narrow, uh, a, a sort of prescribed list of harms, malware, botnets, farming, phishing, spam, uh, spam in brackets, because uh, usually where it's a distribution mechanism uh, for the preceding four harms, um, and others, most recently the European Commission, define DNS abuse as anything bad on the internet that uses a domain name, which is exceptionally broad. You know, that would include challenging speech issues, things like that. And then we have people using the DNS itself for harm, what we often see in denial of service attacks. We see people abusing the DNS itself, so attacking registries and registrars, or both. Um, there's lots of reasons for different definitions of these harms. Uh, the broader harms generally, like the broader definitions generally come into play because there are elements out there that have no place to resolve their issues online. Most obvious example is intellectual property. You know, if there's a copyright or trademark issue, um, you know, online, where do they go to get that solved? Well, the DNS, because it's centralized through ICANN and the GTLD system, but really through the root servers, et cetera, is really the place where you begin to see those politics at play. And so that's where they're gonna congregate. And that's where they're working towards having a broader definition of harms to try and force some accountability into that space for these things. On the other side, you have registries and registrars with narrow technical remits that do a very limited service with very limited tools at their disposal to address these online harms. Um, they want reasonably a pretty constrained problem set that they are responsible for. Inside that, we have the uh, an idea of subsidiarity, which is problems should be resolved basically at the, the closest point to that problem. Um, and so for much of online arms, that's generally hosts or platforms, you know, and so we need to get pretty deep into the internet before it's appropriate to resolve at the layer of the DNS. And so the industry, and the industry meaning domain registries and registrars, um, have a consensus definition of DNS abuse, um, which is that sort of first list I said, phishing, malware, botnets, farming, and spam. Again, spam in parentheses there. Um, I'm gonna presume that this audience is pretty familiar with what those um, harms are. Um, farming is the one that gets the most questions. It's sort of included on this list for somewhat legacy reasons and people often define it differently. Uh, it's also not one I've actually encountered in the wild. It's typically defined as um, a local DNS resolver hijack, usually done by malware on your local machine and a fish. And so there are your local DNS resolvers being redirected to a different web page for phishing. Um, there's not much a registry or registrar could do about that local DNS hijack. That fish is elsewhere on the internet. That would sort of just fall into phishing. So anyway, that's the definition that uh, ICANN contracted parties, so ICANN accredited registries and registrars have adopted formally. Uh, it's based on some work from an organization called the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network it's got a reasonable amount of traction. Uh, there's lots of people who like to debate what else should be in there. My general position is that uh, where there's plenty of work to do on phishing, malware, and botnets, and spam, the sort of core of these problems, 
uh, before we need to argue about what's on the edges. And so we're really focused at the Institute uh, on this set of problems. Um, it also feels like a set of problems that we can sort of wrap our arms around and try and make a difference on. Um, malicious versus compromised. This is another key bit of that definition in that this really um, delineates two different types of DNS abuse. Malicious is where we see a domain registered explicitly from a, a malicious purpose, as in to carry out a fish. Most obvious example, and obvious an example, would be something like you encountered a domain that's like login-paypal-support.pld, where it's probably someone is creating a fake PayPal support login, something like that. There's hard to... You, you would struggle to come up with another use for a domain like domain name like that. Compromised is a benign name uh, that's been compromised typically at the website level, um, could be some other level, that is then being hijacked and used to um, propagate DNS abuse. Um, most commonly, that's a WordPress website um, that wasn't patched, had an old theme, you know, someone used a a uh, stolen plugin or an out-of-date plugin, and it was compromised. Uh, and so inside that website structure, you'll find something that is serving up a fish or malware. Um, this malicious versus compromised distinction is relatively new to the industry, and it's really come to the front as the industry is tied to get more sophisticated in its response to uh, DNS abuse. And it's really about figuring out what layer of the internet is responsible for what types of harms. Because generally, it's inappropriate to act at the layer of the DNS to resolve a compromised website. Um, so it could be a totally benign local bakery that had their WordPress site hacked and is serving up malware. Most registries or registrars would look at that and refer it to the host and the registrant uh, for mitigation, but not turn the domain on or off. And that's probably a point I should make as well, which is that the tools that registries and registrars have at their disposal to deal with these online harms is really just domain suspension. They can prevent a domain from resolving or change its name servers, but they can do very little else. And so there's no granular ability to fix um, a compromised website, which is why that belongs to the host to mitigate. So let's give you a little bit more context um, about the industry itself. So there's 2,500 ICANN accredited registrars. These are companies that can sell generic top level domains. Um, they belong to about 500 corporate families. Uh, the largest of those corporate families owns, I think around 1,700 of those 2,500 credentials. Um, and they use those for what's called drop catching. There's like a sort of technology arms race where having ICANN credentials meant you were more likely to get expiring domain names. Um, but it's so it's really sort of 500 different companies that we need to interact with. There is an untold number of uh, country code TLD accredited registrars that are not ICANN accredited registrars. I think .uk has something like 12,000 accredited registrars. I don't know how many are accredited for .au. They're sort of hard to enumerate um, from outside. Uh, I think they come and go pretty quickly too. Um, we're happy to work with them as well. They're just hard to identify. On the top level domain side, um, there's about 1,500 TLDs, uh, 1,250 generics, um, .org, .com, .horse. There's a whole bunch of them now. Um, design, ninja, some silly, some good. Um, and then there's about 250 country codes, AU, CA, DE, these sorts of things. The industry is primarily managed by contract. At least that's how it works in the generic TLD space. Uh, registries and registrars have a contract with ICANN that sort of dictates how they operate. Those contracts right now um, don't talk a lot about abuse. They have some sections the obligations are ambiguous at best. Um, and in fact, right now, as we speak, um, ICANN accredited registries and registrars are ne 
negotiating with ICANN to increase the obligations inside those contracts to try and raise the floor on dealing with abuse. Um, the broad commercial reason for that is to, is to set a level playing field so that those who are responsible aren't being penalized for doing that. And that sort of goes into this next slide, the economic context of this online abuse. So domain registration is a high volume business for the most part. Uh, there are some boutique corporate registrars who do very you know, expensive, low volume transactions. Um, but by and large, the industry is predominantly uh, companies selling domains at pretty low cost to try and get a high volume of them. Uh, it is also a globally competitive market. And so the product that you buy, if you buy a .org from a, a, a who would be a good Australian registrar, uh, Melbourne IT, um, it's an old one too. Um, you know, if you buy a .org from Melbourne IT, it's exactly the same as a .org that you could buy from High China in China or Hover in Canada. And so these registrars are competing with each other for the same business for very low margins. And this is what drives that sort of collective action problem I think I was referring to earlier, where uh, if you're putting friction into your processes, if you're spending time and energy reducing abuse inside your domain registration platform and your competitors aren't, you're at a disadvantage. And it, it really means that, that registrars become incredibly cost sensitive and changing the economics of the industry is is basically impossible at this point you know domains cost what they do um, making them more expensive would be pretty challenging and also becomes a barrier for getting people online becomes a barrier for expression um, and so there's real consequences to adjusting these things but we do have this issue where we see abuse because it can be cheap and cybercrime generates money um, and so what do we begin to do about that? The answer is first, we need to understand the problem. And to do that, we need to measure where abuse is across the ecosystem. And to do that, I'm gonna pass it over to Rowena, who's running this project for the Institute. Thanks, Graham. Um, and thanks, Narelle, for your wonderful introduction. It's always really nice to be talking to an Australian audience. Um, so thanks for having us here today. Um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about one of the initiatives we run at the Institute called DNS AI Compass, and that's all about measuring DNS abuse as accurately and reliably as we possibly can. Uh, we've created that for our purposes, but we also feel that it's important to share that with uh, anyone who's interested. So we've uh, got a very transparent methodology that explains how we do that, and we publish information on our website. Uh, but first, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the broader initiatives that have tried to measure this problem. So if we could go to the next slide. So uh, in America, they like to say a ballpark figure. Um, this is clearly adapted for the Australian audience with cricket pitch figures. <laughs> so uh, before we started our Compass project. There was something that existed through ICANN called DAR, which is the Domain, domain Abuse Activity Reporting. Um, and DAR tries to measure this problem uh, across the ecosystem. And they, re they produce reports every month and they use a similar methodology in terms of how we've created our project in the sense that they ingest a selection of different uh, reputation block lists um, and put that through a certain filter and come up with a number. So if we're trying to create a broad estimate of how big is this problem, DAR gives us a account of about 650,000 abusive domain names out of the 216 million that exist. So that works out of being about 0.3%. That number uh, is including spam, which is the biggest proportion of the technical abuse that we're measuring. Uh, and I should say here that DAR focuses on DNS abuse with that 
narrower definition that Graham was talking about. So phishing, malware, botnets, spam. Um, generally, uh, we tend to think of spam as a delivery mechanism for the other types of abuse. So when you take spam out of the DAR figures, you're left with about 155,000 for malware, phishing and botnets, which works out to be about 0.07% of the domains that are registered at, at any given time, which is kind of, I think, a pretty manageable amount compared to the amount of domains that are out there. So it's not that the, you know, the vast majority of domain names are being used for bad things. It's really less than 1% that we need to focus on in terms of improving the problem. Uh, so DAR gives us this big figure, but we felt we really needed to get more granular to understand this issue and to figure out what types of approaches might help improve it. So that's why we created Compass. This is a project that we run in collaboration with an academic uh, called Marce Koninsky, who works out of Grenoble University in France. Um, he, we basically approached Marce um, because of some work that he's done in the past. And we asked him, what is the best way to measure DNS abuse as accurately as you can? We want this to be reliable over a period of time so that we can compare month on month. We want it to be really transparent and really credible. We want it to get really granular in terms of what is actually going on and where we can look for areas to improve. So that led to him uh, writing a very comprehensive methodology that you can read if you head to that uh, link on the slide. Um, and that methodology focused on phishing and malware specifically, where he felt that he could get the best evidence to measure this problem. So we put up new data every month. Our, our reporting is two months behind because we also measure mitigation. Uh, so this is what you'll see on the website at the moment. And this is starting to give us a broad understanding of the trends in malware and phishing over the period that we've been reporting, which is from May through to January. So you can see here that phishing is remaining fairly stable in terms of the numbers. Um, <coughs> sorry. But malware tends to jump around quite a lot. Uh, there are a few theories for why it dropped off in the kind of European summer of 2022. Some of those are related to a particular uh, malware activity called Emotet, which was subject to law enforcement activity before this reporting period. Uh, but there's a lot of different theories and reasons why malware is, uh, is sort of going up and down. And what happened in January, you know, we're still waiting to really figure out what's going on there. You might find when you look at our numbers that they are smaller than some other measurements in the industry. And that's because our, this project really aims to opt optimize for accuracy rather than giving a complete picture of every single bad thing that is happening. So we, the other thing to note about this is that we count unique domain names. So that scale on the left is uh, not looking at URLs, which is quite common in some of these threat feeds. You get a uh, domain name that creates a unique URL every time anybody visits it. In our reporting, that would just count as one unique domain name. Okay, next slide, please. So in terms of the trends that we see around mitigation, so when these domains come into um, the systems that are run by Core Labs who do the data collection, they go back, they go to the domain name and they take a measurement of a bunch of different factors related to that domain name. They then go back and repeat those measurements at a set intervals, which start very close together at five minutes and then extend out into larger intervals the further away you get until it's 12 hours and then that continues for 30 days. The reason for doing this is that it allows us to track what has happened to the domain name. So we get this sense of whether it's the harm has been mitigated or not, which is we think really important for getting a better understanding of this problem. 
So you can see here that mitigation has been fairly high across this reporting period. It was probably higher than I expected it would be going into this project. Um, mitigation is showing in green here. And then there's a, a that orange part, which shows not mitigated. There's also a lighter orange color that shows uncategorized. So that means that the system we're using was unable to determine either way, whether it was mitigated or not. And then there's a small category of unprocessed. Um, uh, if you uh, were to visit our website, we also have the ability to toggle between isolating for malware and isolating for phishing. Um, so you can see, see it broken down in that way. Okay, if we could go to the next slide. So the other thing that we look at, which is, uh, as Graham was saying earlier in this presentation, becoming increasingly important in these discussions, is the concept of malicious and compromised. This becomes very relevant when we start thinking about mitigation and where that activity is taking place. Um, because if it's a compromised domain name, it's usually the case that the registrar doesn't have the tools available to act on this and they'll have to refer that to the hosting provider. Um, some registrars do also host, and so in some cases they are able to act. What we found is interesting as we're looking through this data is that there is a different breakdown of compromised and malicious for phishing and than what there is for malware. So what you're seeing at the moment is isolated to phishing, and the malicious registrations are there in blue and compromised in purple. So over the months that we've been conducting this research, it's about 70,000% of, sorry, 70% of the unique domain names that we identify involved in phishing are maliciously registered. So registered for the purposes of that phishing, which generally means it would be more appropriate for the registrar to act on that domain name. Next slide. So this is the same chart, but now we're looking at malware and you can see that the breakdown is really different here. There's a much higher proportion that is compromised, um, particularly in months where malware is fairly low in terms of numbers, the percentage kind of moves around quite a lot, but generally we see in most months around 14 to 20% of malware is maliciously registered. In those months of low volume, some of them, sometimes it's a bit higher than that. But the main point here is the, the difference between the two that malware tends to be more compromised, making it usually less appropriate for the registrar to act and more important that the hosting provider is involved in the mitigation solution. Next slide. So where does that leave us? Um, as we're running this project, we've been beginning to have a better understanding of these trends over time. And we can see that malware varies and has lower rate, rates of malicious registrations and that phishing is more stable but has higher rates of malicious registrations. We're also seeing fairly high mitigation rates across the board. Um, but what we're also finding as we dive deeper into this data is that the abuse is not evenly distributed across the ecosystem. So what you see at the moment is what we have put out publicly and it's all aggregated high level data. We have much more data than this that we are working our way through and thinking very carefully about how we report on publicly. But we have that data going down to the individual level of uh, particular registrars and also top level domain um, registries so for example, .au versus .uk versus .org, we have that breakdown, which we're finding is really very helpful as we're thinking about what can we do to improve this problem? And there's a few trends that are starting to emerge, which I'm going to talk to you about today. So if we could go to the next slide. So this is um, what I'm gonna share here is some of our fairly early thinking about what we can do about this data. Uh, and most of this was 
done looking at a, an example of our January data. So what we're seeing is there's kind of a few groups where we think that we could have a big impact on focusing on. So the first group we see as we look through this data is the registrars that have a high volume and a high growth business model. This means by virtue of being very big, they have a larger amount of the abuse because they have a larger amount of the registration. So it makes sense. These registrars overall tend to be fairly low in terms of abuse per 100K when you normalize that for the amount of uh, domains they have registered. And generally they do have high levels of mitigation. A lot of them have particularly fast mitigation times as well. But because of their size, we're thinking that probably this group of about 26 registrars are worth focusing on because collectively, because of their size, they have about 75% of the malicious registrations. Next slide, please. So how can we improve the situation for this particular group? Um, part of it is going to be about getting better at preventing malicious registrations coming in in the first place. And there's a bunch of different ideas and work going on in this space at the moment. Part of it is going to be about looking for marginal gains on increasing the rates of mitigation. And some of it is going to be around speeding up mitigation for those who aren't as fast as others, where we think that could improve harm prevention by getting to those domains more quickly. Next slide. Um, in terms of where else abuse tends to be concentrated, there's another fairly small handful of what we're loosely calling outliers at the moment. These tend to be registrars who are smaller-ish, not, they're not in that top 20, 25 registrars. And when we look at their data, we see things where we think there could be improvements. So for example, they might have a very high rate of malicious domains per 100K, or they might have very high rates of new malicious registrations coming in because we look at this from a new registration perspective as well. These registrars tend to be unengaged in industry events. They're not people that we see at ICANN meetings. They're not people that we um, speak to at these types of forums where people are concerned about these issues. So the approach here is probably going to be quite different. And this accounts based on our January data for about 10% of the malicious registrations that we're seeing. We could go to the next slide. So for this group, um, the first step is really an active outreach to understand, do they know about this problem? Are they aware of it? Sharing the information that we have with them to get an understanding of whether they want to, want to engage in this problem. If they do, there's quite probably quite a lot of things they can do to improve their policies and to improve their processes, um, which would really help tackling the abuse. Uh, and if they are less willing to engage, there is also the aspect of raising the floor of contractual ex expectations, which is what Graham was talking about earlier in terms of the negotiations that are happening at the moment between ICANN and the registrars and registries that are contracted with ICANN and the way that uh, abuse is covered in those contracts. Next slide. So overall, um, what does that mean? It means that we think there's kind of two groups at the moment where there's quite specific areas that they could improve on. And actually that's quite a manageable place to be, the kind of two big groups with different types of problems and ways that we think that we can help them improve. And by focusing on that, that would give us about 85% of the malicious registrations that we're seeing, which is kind of, quite reassuring and quite manageable. Next slide, please. So in terms of what other things can be done to help uh, improve the situation. So what I've been talking about so far 
uh, in terms of those groups is focused on malicious registrations because the registrars are much more at the, the center point of being able to mitigate and prevent harm. There's also the aspect of compromise registrations, and this is where we need to work beyond the ICANN community and we need to reach out further into other areas of the ecosystem, some of those being hosting providers uh, and people who are concerned about this more widely. Because for a compromised registration, it might be that the hosting provider, usually the hosting provider is typically in a better position to act to, to address the issue than the registrar. Part of this also involves an education of end users. So improving um, people's general ability to keep their website secure um, and focusing on this as a more of a public policy issue in terms of general cybersecurity hygiene. So making sure that people understand the importance of updating their content management, system, content management system, having good password hygiene, things like that. Next slide, please. Um, and the other aspect of our Compass project that focus, it focuses more on the registry part of the DNS ecosystem. Um, generally, registries are one more step removed from the registrar who has the relationship with the customer, but they also have a role to play here. And that usually means it's around managing their registrars as a channel to the customer. There's a lot of different ways that they can do that. And the policies and the processes that a top level domain has have an impact on how registrars mitigate abuse or prevent abuse. There are a lot of really interesting pro programs out there by different registries who are trying to improve how registrars respond to this. And one of the issues that we're thinking about as we expand our Compass project is how can we understand the impact of these policies and processes? Um, so, for example, one of the uh, policies we could look at is incentive schemes. There's a variety of different top level domains who run an incentive scheme. That means that if registrars meet certain abuse expectations, they get a discount on the domain names that they buy. So what we think would be really fascinating to look at in Compass is do registrars perform differently in different registries and are there reasons for that that we can see based on their policies and processes so for example do they seem to have better abuse records in registries that have incentive schemes so that's some of the really interesting other areas that we're looking at as ways to address and improve this problem next slide um, and finally we wanted to give you a sense of what can you do to to prevent to, to um, tackle this problem as well. So one of those things is around compromise, whether that's in your, your own day-to-day -day life in terms of websites that you're responsible for. Um, we have some great resources on this, which we'll share as well, but things like um, updating your content management, management system, being careful about which themes you use, auditing plugins, um, the, those are also practices that can be passed on to end users or customers if you are in a space where you work with people who run their own websites. Um, and then the other thing that is really important is around reporting abuse. And we have another initiative which is focused all on reporting abuse and making sure it gets to the right place, uh, which I think I'm going to hand over in the next slide to Graham to tell you all about. Thank you, Rowena. There's a couple, before I get into NetBeacon and some of our other work, there's a couple top line things from your piece of this that I wanted to highlight. Um, the first is going back to that cricket pitch amount, <laughs> ballpark figures, is, is really that the amount of abusive name names, domain names that are out there is a manageable amount. Like it's a problem that I think collectively and not just the Institute, you know, people engaged in this problem around the world can make a difference on. And that, so that to me is a really optimistic piece. The other bit is that it's as a percentage of the domain names that are out there, it's a tiny fraction. And that's also really good news because there's often a pervasive sense that, you know, all of these things out there are 
um, you know, a huge percentage of domain names are problematic, and that just appears not to be true. I will caveat what I just said, though, with the note that measuring or counting domain names is a terrible measure of harm. You know, a single fish can do a lot of economic damage to individuals, and so we need to be thoughtful about that. Um, uh, mitigation, as you noted, Rowena, is, is so mitigation meaning the harm is no longer present is much higher than we thought. And so that's really good news too. Um, I think, however, it highlights just how much work we have to do across preventative measures, preventing malicious domain names from getting registered in the first place, reactive measures, getting those reported really quickly, um, enabling registries and registrars to take action. Um, one of the last bits I'll, I'll highlight there too is that the rate of abuse of names is so low that it becomes a really interesting detection problem. Um, you know, in machine learning times, this would, the, your data sets are extremely imbalanced when you're finding a single malicious registration for every 10 or 20,000 other ones coming in the door. Being able to pinpoint those and prevent them from coming in is pretty tricky. Um, but I think there's some really interesting work to be done there. The ML stuff aside, um, there is lots of abusive names that end up in people's inboxes or um, on their phones from smishing campaigns uh, on a daily basis. Being able to report those to where they need to go is difficult. Um, there's going back to that um, registry and registrar slide where I was talking about just how many players there are in the industry. It's a deeply complicated industry with a lot of different players, each with their own abuse reporting pages, their own abuse reporting standards. Um, and so if you've got a malicious domain name and you want to tell someone about it, um, it's hard to do that. Um, you need to know what who is is, need to be looking up who the registrar, et cetera, et cetera. So we launched a service uh, last year called NetBeacon. It's live and available at netbeacon.org and it's a centralized abuse reporting system. Uh, so you can go there and report DNS abuse, so malware, botnets, uh, phishing and spam. Um, to any ICANN accredited registrar. Uh, it's a set of forms, they're pretty easy to use. Um, and what it does is it structures that input um, so that you, we've got it, we can make sure that you're capturing information that a registry or registrar um, uh, needs. Uh, we then enrich that information by appending to your report useful information from uh, a variety of online sources like reputation block lists, uh, we try and go get screenshots so that when a registrar gets this report that you've submitted, it's standardized and enriched. It makes their job easier. So this makes it easier for you to report abuse. It makes it uh, better for recipients. Um, and best of all, this thing is free. Um, the Institute is also not for profit. We don't do anything that makes money. We produce these reports uh, for registries and registrars. We run this NetBeacon service. It is free for everybody. There will never be a cost recovery or a charge for it. Um, so please go check it out. Um, it looks like this. This is sort of an example of one of the phishing forms. Um, I should point out it's uh, got APIs so that you can report into it if you have a large amount of abusive domain names, maybe you're operating an ISP, maybe a hosting company, you're seeing lots of these things come in and you would like to do something about them, um, you can submit abuse, you can create an account and submit abuse reports and you can do that via the API too. Um, the caveat, especially for this audience, is that we're still working on integrating CCTLDs. Um, and so we don't actually have .au integrated yet. Uh, it's on the list. We were talking with the CEO of Auda at the ICANN meeting last week in um, Mexico about how we're going to find some shortcuts to do that. Um, and so expect those to come online, hopefully in the nearest future. Then we're also gonna be expanding the reporting channels so that we can take these abuse reports uh, and report them not just to the registry or registrar, uh, but also to the hosting company or the mail service provider or the content distribution network. And that allows us to do things like take an abuse report for a compromised domain name and say, ah, look, you know, we can see that this domain name has some benign content. The hack is, you know, on the other side of wp-includes, which in the URL is a very clear sign that it's a hacked WordPress site. And instead of sending that right to the registrar, we send it to the host, 
um, give them the opportunity to try and mitigate it, and then maybe escalate to the registrar if nothing's been done, we can build those escalation paths. In the case of malicious registrations, then we want to send them to both the host and the registrar because there's no harm in taking that domain off the internet, but we should also try and disrupt the hosting too. So the more abuse that we can funnel through this tool, the more sophisticated we can make it, um, and the more online harms we're able to tackle. So it's a very exciting project. Please go take a look. Always happy for feedback on that as we continue to develop it and make it better. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that the technology behind NetBeacon was generously donated by CleanDNS, um, and they also donated some of their development time to continue adapting it for our, our purposes. So a big thanks to them. Um, if you're interested in some more education, we've got some best practices out there. We produce some on a pretty regular basis. Um, we've got one for general users about how to secure your uh, website, which is really about securing your content management system. Um, I, you know, it's in those figures from Rowena, but you know, somewhere between 25 and 40 percent of um, uh, abusive domain names are compromised. We can make a huge impact on that if we can get um, people to manage those a little bit better. Um, we've got another best practice on making phishing reports useful, what's really required for a registrar to take action on a fish. And then also we have a generic abuse policy that we came up with so that if you're operating some online service and you need an abuse policy so that you can be more proactive on, on addressing abuse on your platform, you can take ours, you can adapt it as you see fit. It's Creative Commons licensed. Uh, we just wanted to give people a starting place so that they could have the policy groundwork to be more proactive here. And I think that leads us to just about where we want to be in terms of time. Um, I've put here our contact information if you want to reach out. The, just um, dunking on Twitter a little bit here, that account still works, but you know you can find me on Mastodon too, um, or feel free to um, email uh, Rowena or myself. But uh, I think we've got about 10 minutes left. I saw some questions in the chat about PKI, um, and then uh, we're happy to take any other questions too. Oh, thanks for that, that Graham. That's um, and, and Rowena. That's that is really interesting. I I hadn't realised NetBeacon was so simple to use. So, uh, and uh, good to see that it's out there. I encourage everybody to use it. We'll have to make sure that we put some of that, uh, some links to NetBeacon up on our own website so that people can can be funnelled across to your great resources. But yeah, we did have a question from Phil Argy, and hi Phil, it's been ages. Um, his question was, isn't it time we had a public key lookup service? So that signed emails, documents, et cetera, would become the default, making it much harder for people to commit fraud untraceably, at least to the extent their key pair is at high security level like the gatekeeper. Yeah, so isn't it time we had a public key lookup service so that signed emails and documents, et cetera, would become the default? You got some thoughts on that one? It's not really yeah, DNS abuse, so, but still, yeah. So thanks, Norell, and, and, and thanks, Philip, for the question. I, I admit I don't spend a lot of time thinking about um, uh, PKI stuff. I do spend some time thinking about how we build and manage identities online and what is the infrastructure should that to enable that. Domain names have been a proxy for that for a long time because they are centralized, they're authoritative, you know, you can figure out who owns a domain name most of the time. Um, and I think in your follow-up question, you, you, you reference uh, distributed ledger tech or blockchain, also another thing that people are using for identity, PKI. I think all of these things are different methods of, save, of solving similar problems. Uh, I don't have a strong opinion on, on which one is gonna be the, the best. I'm not sure a centralized authority for identity is a good idea. Having said that, I have real concerns about um, blockchain and domain name technology. There's a couple of companies that are engaged now in um, bridging the gap between the traditional DNS and blockchain names so that people can go buy a, a crypto name and it exists in the crypto namespace. Um, that, uh, that world is by definition unregulatable, which is a feature for some, but also it's, you know, we look at the abuse we see in the traditional DNS and, uh, you know, we can, as I was saying, get our arms around that um, a future where there is no centralization within the domain name system. 
is a future where I think there's an awful lot of online harms and very little tools at our disposal to do something about it. Um, so thanks, Bill. I hope that gets at least approximately close to answering your question. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, part of the problem that Phil's posing is that who would run that sort of infrastructure? It's not really a, it's a, I mean, some of the big email providers have tried to add extra security through sort of concentrating their validations and so forth, but it's not really a, I mean, where where would this type of infrastructure come from? I mean, that's like, which, which space? I mean, is this another IETF working group that needs to happen? We've certainly had those come and go over the years. So, yeah, I think it's, a, it's a, certainly an interesting problem for, for us within the industry to to try and wrap our heads around. Um, oh, I think we've got another question come in. Let me just check that one. Um, I I can see it. It was it was yeah, yeah, Philip yeah. again. Thank you, Philip. Um, uh, it's about uh, thank you for the the kind words about NetBeacon. Uh, you pose like you're asking if you could have an email address to to send you know screenshots and 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 you know, reports do. There's a reason that we don't do that right now. And it's sort of fundamental to the problem that NetBeacon is trying to solve, which is registries and registrars get literally thousands of unstructured abuse reports a day. And they're often unevidenced. They're, uh, you know, hard to read, varying standards of information. And so registries and registrars spend huge time and energy triaging these tickets for very little value. And so by forcing people to use the structure of NetBeacon, to use those forms, and I acknowledge it's friction, it is friction, we're able to get more abuse off the internet by, by asking reporters to do a little bit more work. Right. I have another question here. <laughs> so you said you're doing some work on, on the country code top level domains. So ha have you got any any indication yet on where .au sits in the scheme of things and .nz as well, which is, of course, a neighbour of ours that we, we care a lot about? Uh, like as in where abuse rates are? Where, in, where, in do we, where do we sit in this grand scheme of things? Because we feel we're being targeted on an industrial scale. <laughs> Is that the sort of evidence that you're seeing as well? Well, you, yeah, you, you know, it's a little hard to talk about because I don't want to air anyone's dirty laundry. I would <laughs> say, by and large, .au looks pretty good. Um, there, you're not wrong that there is some. We see some phishing and malware that the, in .au, um, and talking with out on, on on how to deal with some of that. NZ, I think, is pretty squeaky clean. Um, and my sense is that is because their registration volume is low enough. They have a human who looks at every single one. Um, and so that makes it pretty easy to identify um, some malicious domain names. Yeah, yeah. Um, Actually, mentioning malicious, you, you did have these figures in there. There was, what was it, 30% of um, is not malicious. I, I'm, I'm struggling to think of what, what would be a not malicious case of um, uh uh, these sorts of things, you know, phishing and, and I mean, how, how is it, how can it be not malicious? Is it just trying to take you to a, a nice site to see a flower instead of the one you asked for or what? No, <laughs> it, so, about this? <laughs> so the, the domain was originally registered for a benign purpose. So it's the example I think I used was a bakery where you're running Graham's Bakery. You've got a website that people can go to and it's still about my delicious breads and baked goods. Uh, but then someone hacked my WordPress and somewhere else on that site, there's now a phishing and I might not have any idea it's there and I'm still trying to run my bakery website, but also someone else is using my website to serve up a fish or distribute malware or something like that. And that's how you end up with a benign domain registration and a mostly benign website, but some corner of it has been co-opted by a yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, third party without their consent to go do bad things and you might that people might not even notice it yeah actually we've got another question come through and that's from a dns service perspective so where do solutions like open dns google dns cloudflare and quad nine fit into your um your world or, or your organization into so your we certainly talk uh, we certainly communicate with a bunch of those organizations on our on a pretty regular basis um uh the resolvers is an interesting place right now 
Quad Nine is is having a fight in Germany over an intellectual property yeah. issue where they're they were sued, I think, by Sony. I think I might Sony. have that wrong. Yeah. yeah, about for resolving a website that was, I, I think, allowing people to pirate movies or something like that. Yeah. Um, Quad Nine also offers filtered uh, DNS resolver so that you can choose to opt in to have them remove some harms from the internet for, for you. And I like that opt-in model. I, I run a pie hole, which is a, <laughs> a little bit of tech on my home network that blocks ads and prevents malware and stuff like that from my own network. And I, I think those are valuable services. I really like that they opt in. I don't like having people decide what I can see on the internet for me, but maybe that's a little bit of my weirdo you know, radical anarchist roots or something uh, exactly. where that arbitrary authority bothers me. Um, but uh, being able, next step is be able to go like, okay, if they have these good lists of malicious domain names or dangerous domain names, can we begin to get those lists? Can we begin to evidence them? So it's not just a name, but it's a name, it's a screenshot, it's a description of the harm, and then begin to get those to registries and registrars to do something about it. And that's sort of a general theme for a lot of our work, which is there are organizations like those, lots of them, internet security companies around the world that have really good data. Um, and they use that data for, for enriching their products, preventing harm to their customers. But can we get them to begin taking those next steps where once they've baked that in, once they've done the protection that they need to, can we then begin to get that data to the registries and registrars so they can do something about those harms? Um, and the more registries and registrars do something, the more they learn, the more they're able to identify who those, um, you know, uh, malicious customer or, or, you know, people exploiting their services, who they are, uh, and can reduce that um, in the future. And so we're really interested in communicating with those organizations and helping close the loop. So if you work for an internet security company or interact with some on a regular basis and they've got this data and they're just not, doing that next step with it, we'd love to talk with them. It's sort of a, a common refrain for us with law enforcement, consumer protection around the world, because we deal with them quite a bit too, which is they can't possibly investigate every fish. Law enforcement has no capacity to do that. They might not want to tell you, but of course they cannot. And so there is some that rises to a level where they're acting upon it and maybe doing an investigation, but there's lots that they're not. And so we're beginning to get them to be like, great, we're never going to touch these but boy, we wish we could do something about them. But the ecosystem is way too complex for us to try and figure out all the different registrars that these need to go to. And so beginning to funnel that into NetBeacon so that we're doing that, reducing that complexity for them and hopefully making the internet a little bit safer um, is pretty exciting work. Right. That's a lot, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've now hit the hour, so it's my job to say thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Graham and Rowena, for, for that interesting information. And thank you to everybody who's attended for and also for providing your questions. Um, we've got another session, as I mentioned earlier, on uh, the Network Time Protocol, which will be an in-person one, which we will also try and film, uh, but that will be held in Melbourne in May. So looking forward to that one. You'll be able to bring along a few, bunch, a few people for that too, folks. So that should be really, really good. So yes, once again, thank you so much to Graham and Rowena for spending the time with us. We will put this up on our website. Oh, as soon as the video is edited in a fit, fit state to, to upload, and we'll be adding some extra links and so forth in there so that you can all follow up with that. So yes, thank you. Um, and thank you to everybody who attended. We'll call it quits thank now, you. folks. Bye. Thank, Thanks. Thank you, Narelle. Thank you, everyone.